uh, Tina will be giving an overview of um, military impacts in Hawaii. Um, also talking about the RIMPAC exercises, what they are um, and the current situation. Um, so Tina, please. Aloha everybody. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share about RIMPAC and thank you to the poets. That's like, uh, I mean, my talk is gonna be about all of these negative impacts and the struggle against the military and that poem is such a beautiful way to start to remind us that like we're not just fighting against something we're fighting for something i always get chicken skin when i watch it it's like my seventh time watching it so thank you so much um so my name is tina grandinetti and uh, i'm a member of the cancel impact coalition Hawaii peace and justice um and also um women's voices women speak and the international women's network against militarism uh, before I start, I just want to share a little bit about my own genealogy and my positionality. Uh, I was born and raised here in occupied Hawaii in Mililani, so just a couple of towns away from Schofield Barracks. Um, but my mother is from Okinawa. She's Uchinanchu, um, and she grew up in Okinawa in the aftermath of World War II um, when U.S. and Japanese forces killed almost one third of my people. Um, in three months. Uh, so though we both grew up in really different places, we both grew up under um, US occupation, both on islands where roughly a quarter of the land is controlled by the US military. Um, and I share this to first acknowledge that I'm a settler here um, in Hawaii, but also because I think my genealogy really speaks to the pervasiveness of US empire. Um, in the Pacific. And for me, RIMPAC is kind of this physical manifestation of militarism's creep across Oceania um, and also represents the ongoing desecration of indigenous lands and the suppression of indigenous sovereignties from Hawaii to Guahan to Okinawa. And um, it's really important that as we talk about RIMPAC, we're aware that even though we're talking about this one event, this one spectacle that occurs every two years, we're really trying to tackle the broader violence of militarism in Hawaii today and also throughout Hawaii's history. Um, not only did US military personnel back the coup that overthrew Queen Liliuokalani, um, but also the joint resolution that created the lie that Hawaii is part of the United States in 1899, uh, 1898 occurred specifically because of this whole like imperialist fervor that took hold during the Spanish-American War. So the US needed Hawaii as um, a coaling station for the Navy and took it out of supposed military necessity. Um, and that really reminds us of the critical role of US militarism in suppressing EA in all of its many diverse forms over so many generations. So when we speak about EA as sovereignty, but also as life and as breath, uh, we can see that militarism and war making are the antithesis to EA. Um, not only in that US military occupation denies Hawaii of its sovereignty, but also because if EA means life and breath, then militarism means the taking of that life and breath. It's the creation of whole entire industries, um, the transformation of Aina for the express purpose of killing, um, right? Like we're so fortunate to have um, Kyle's research on Kealalao Opu'uloa, the place we, most of us now know as Pearl Harbor, um, which through which we can see that this place was transformed from Aina Momona, this like fertile breadbasket of Oahu that was rich with local ia um, and was transformed to a nodal point for US empire to project its power all across the world. Um, and then as a consequence, um, transform this place into one that's riddled with contamination and pollution and super fun sites. So in that concept, in that context, to me, RIMPAC is a symbol of the depth of this fundamental contradiction between EA and militarism and war. 
Um, so a quick background on what exactly it is. The Rim of the Pacific exercises are the world's largest maritime war games. Um, they've been happening since 1971, typically held every two years and hosted in Hawaii by the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And it's really difficult to wrap our heads around how large this event is. In 2018, RIMPAC brought 47 surface ships, five submarines, more than 200 aircraft, and 25,000 troops from 25 countries to Hawaii to blast and bomb Hawaiian lands and waters for six weeks. And when I say blast and bomb, I mean like for real kind blast and bomb. Like we're talking live fire trainings um, where they practice civilian home raids, where like they'll literally create um, like mock homes and villages and practice raiding civilian communities. Uh, we're talking submarine missile defense, amphibious landings on beaches like Mokapu and Waimanalo, and also sink exercises where they literally shoot decommissioned ships with land-based missiles and also um, submarine torpedoes until they sink to the bottom of the ocean and then they just leave them there. And that all happens just 55 miles off the coast of Kauai. And the US's own, um, the US Navy's own EIS states that these exercises release toxins and carcinogenic materials into the ocean. Um, and this, the military's disregard for indigenous lands and waters during RIMPAC is, is really one in the same with its overall disregard for indigenous lives and bodies. So for example, we know that during RIMPAC, we see a spike in gendered violence. Um, you have all of these men coming to a feminized and exoticized island nation, expecting to be welcomed by women, um, feeling entitled to those women's bodies. And this is where we start getting into this dense knot of um, intersecting oppressions. And one of the ways that I find it helpful to understand this is through the idea of militarism, which uh, Pacific scholar Teresia Teoyua coined to describe the connection between the military industry and the tourism industry where each one disguises and enables the other. Um, so at RIMPAC, on most years, uh, troops are given up to 12 Liberty Days. And this is where they can go on tours of the island, they can eat at restaurants together, learn or take surf lessons, snorkel with turtles. Um, and you think about that, right? Like these troops come to blow up the ancestral sacred lands of Kanaka Maoli, contaminate lands and waters, normalize the suppression of Hawaiian sovereignty, um, practice killing native people, colonized people, people of color. And then after that, they go and get to consume the beauty of Hawaii as though they're on vacation. So this is militarism, imperialism, and heteropatriarchy all wrapped up in, in one as they always are. Um, and RIMPAC also enables these same structures of oppression to um, root themselves elsewhere. Um, for example, in recent years, Indonesia um, has participated in RIMPAC and for a while they were actually barred from receiving uh, US military aid because of human rights violations um, in East Timor. Um, but now they're invited back to RIMPAC despite their ongoing um, genocide of the West Papuan people. And the U.S. is training them here, and in doing so, they're making Hawaii complicit in the massacre of another Pacific people. Um, similarly, Israel also participates. Um, and remember, at RIMPAC, they're doing counterinsurgency trainings where they practice civilian home raids. So Hawaii then becomes complicit in the violence against Palestinians, another occupied nation. Um, there's also this innovation expo where participating countries, they like exchange and share all of their latest military technologies. Um, and they celebrate this 
kind of as like a tech fair, but it also contributes to the constant amplification and intensification of militaries across the Indo-Pacific region. So not just the US military, um, but every participating nation. Uh, so I haven't even gotten to this year yet, <laughs> but this year in the middle of the pandemic, RIMPAC is still happening, um, but we are seeing some changes. Uh, the exercises have been postponed sh and shortened to just August 17th to August 31st, and they've been limited to an at-sea only event. Uh, and we could call this a victory, but really it's so frustrating to see our public officials settle for this, these really like small concessions. And I say small because I think probably most of us on this call can agree that hosting war games in the middle of a pandemic is one, about one of the least essential activities you could think of um, and takes away resources from um, protecting our communities from this virus. But beyond that, even when you look at the actual logistics of this plan, it's really dangerous. Um, a even a limited rim pack will bring logistical support teams on land. Um, and as we'll, we're going to hear from Keisha, keeping sailors at sea isn't safer either. It's literally putting civilian and military lives at risk because ships have been proven to be incubators for the virus. Um, and the US military already has elevated rates of COVID-19. So if an at sea uh, if an outbreak occurs at sea during RIMPAC, then RIMPAC will absolutely not be an at sea only event uh, because those sailors will have to disembark and our communities will likely have to bear the burden of quarantining them and, um, and providing them access to military care. I mean, to medical care. <laughs> and um, we're gonna hear more about that from Keisha, but this is also not a crazy hypothetical. Just this week, two sailors in the Philippines Navy tested positive for COVID-19 um, and they went into quarantine, but the ship that they were stationed on is still slated to come here for RIMPAC. Um, on top of that, um, military personnel have been exempted by the state um, from the 14-day quarantine requirement. Uh, and in, they're still subject to their, the military's own restriction of movement orders, but these are much more lax. And during the first two weeks of July alone, over 4,000 personnel and their dependents arrived in Hawaii under that exemption. Um, I think like beyond the immediate threat of COVID, it's also really scary that this insistence on hosting RIMPAC in the middle of a pandemic really shows us America's full on addiction to military spending and war. Um, even actually right now, as we speak, uh, we're talking about RIMPAC, but there's another large scale, scale military exercise happening on Oahu called Lightning Forge. It involves 5,500 Hawaii based troops, as well as 150 Thai troops. And its focus is specifically on preparing the US for a shift from counterinsurgency tactics, which were dominant in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, to near peer warfare. And I just learned what that means today. It's basically military speak for um, countries that have similar military capabilities to the US. And so in our part of the world, we're always talking, when we talk about near peer warfare, we're talking about war with China. Um, and the Indo Pacific Command already requested $20.1 billion of additional spending over the next five years um, to contain China. And I keep like, every time I think about that number, I keep thinking about this one quote from uh, Council Rampat Coalition Aotearoa, where they said um, on one of their posters, you can't prepare for peace while simultaneously preparing for war. Right? It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a self-fulfilling industry. Ultimately, this spending works to secure the continuation of um, the political and economic dominance of the US, but not. it doesn't work at all to secure the well-being of the people of the US, let alone the people of Hawaii, or in this case, even the troops and sailors that are part of the military, right? Because when we're talking about national security, we are talking about basically 
ensuring the security of white supremacy and imperialism, not genuine security against war or viruses for our communities, and definitely not AL. Um, but I guess we also have to like, I wanna like highlight a couple hopeful things. Like there are, we're hearing calls for a global ceasefire, a reduction in global military spending. Um, 29 Democrats signed a letter um, demanding cuts to defense spending. So I think like so many things in this pandemic, we also are seeing, we're seeing the intensification of certain structural violences, but we're also seeing a moment where we can maybe reflect on um, the world we live in and push forward a different narrative and a different vision of our future. And with that future in mind, I actually wanna end by looking back to the past as we always should, um, to honor the genealogies of resistance that uh, kind of inform our efforts against RIMPAC today, specifically the Pateko Olave Ohana and the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific. Uh, they fought against RIMPAC for like 10 years because Koho Olave was actually being used as a target during RIMPAC exercises. And amazingly, the PKO, this group of young Kanaka, were able to pressure Australia, New Zealand, um, the UK, and Japan to pull out of the Ko'olawe trainings um, and refuse to bomb the island during RIMPAC. Um, and another beautiful thing, too, is that the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific organized around this issue also. And they rec because they recognized that RIMPAC and Ko'olawe played a big part in suppressing major national liberation movements across the Pacific. Um, and in 1984, in their Pacific Bulletin, they wrote a statement, um, if successful, our efforts to stop the RIMPAC 84 exercises, especially to stop the bombing of Koho'olawe during these military exercises, can make a significant contribution to the demilitarization of the Pacific. Um, so when you watch footage um, from that era, uh, people like Moani Akaka talking about RIMPAC at the time, it's kind of heartbreaking because you hear them talk about RIMPAC bringing five countries to bomb Hawaii's lands and waters, and now it brings 26. But it's also empowering because it reminds us that in fighting RIMPAC, we're continuing this, like we're not, we're not alone, we're not the first ones to do it. We're continuing this long tradition of resistance. We're taking another inhale and another exhale um, towards, a, towards a better future. Um, and the other day after I was watching the, that documentary footage, I actually texted um, another Cancel Room Pack Coalition member, Kavena, that I was feeling super hopeless. Um, that after all these years, RIMPAC not only hasn't stopped, but it stopped, but it's actually grown. And he texted me like right away. He just texted me, we beat the US military once, we'll do it again. And <laughs> I think that's why I wanna end on this history to remind us that we can. Thank you. Mahalo Tina, uh, that's a perfect note to end your presentation on and um, important to keep in mind that genealogy of um, resistance and also creation right of creating a new uh, set of possibilities for the future uh, Kanaloa Kaho'olawe was bombed and has been uh, now saved uh, by the PKO um, and now we're looking to save the rest of Kanaloa and so that's a segue to uh, Billy's talk who's going to be talking about the work of Kia'i Kanaloa Network uh, and how um, RIMPAC threatens um, uh, the realm of Kanaloa and also what we can do about it. So please, Billy, aloha. Aloha, um, mahalo for having me. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I like to mahalo, aloha iho ia Honolulu for organizing this panel and inviting me um, and especially for recognizing uh, the historic an ongoing assault on Kanawha by the U.S. military. So I would like to start off where Tina finished and to say that, um, yeah, Kanawha is unbeatable. One of the definitions of Kanawha is unconquerable. 
So I just like to start that. But um, yeah, U.S. military will never win. Um, I'm gonna do a pull it, but it's not the kind that you need to close your guys' eyes for or anything. Um, it's one that's used in kuula ceremonies and places like um, Haleolona Fish Pond, but uh, primarily it's used to <clears throat> honor Kanaloa. E kanaloa nuia ke kanaloa hauna vela, kanaloa ke ala mai ve ula kala, kane ke ala ula kala. Kanaloa no hui du moana nui moana iti moana o o i ka i anu i ka i ai. Kamano ka nyuhi ke kohola ho ho nu. O ke kai ho honua he, o ke kai hulia palaua, o ke kai kia honu, o ke kai ho ka ilolo. O la ke kino vale vale o na hauna valo nao valo a kanaloa i pa a kamaka. Kamaka valo a kanaloa o la. Lana i ke kai lana i koho nua, lana i koho bo a kanaloa. I ka mo ku pa papa, ka papa ka haka ke au lono. O lono ko pa o la i ke au a kanaloa. I, that, I, I just wanted to share that because it um, helps us to warm up into a discussion about Kanaloa. And to further preface this, this dialogue, I, uh, I think we need to first lean into a better understanding of Akua. And, and while I don't have to explain that to many of you, um, there's a kind of a clear thread that I, I hope to jump on for this dialogue. And this, that is when, when you see a Kinolao of an Akua, you're not seeing a representation of that akua, right? You, you are seeing that akua. So whenever you see um, these kinolao, um, it's, it's important to recognize that, that that is kanaloa. So when you hear me say kanaloa, I could be talking about whales, I could be talking about honu, uh, clouds, uh, water, or the ocean itself. Um, and kanaloa is, uh, made one, a major akua <clears throat> for the Hawaiian pantheon, as well as a main akua for other oceanic ohana. Um, Ta'aroa, Tangaroa, Kanaloa. Kanaloa is <clears throat> within this, this upper echelon of, of Hawaiian akua, right, as a, as a creator. And Kanaloa, the word, the definition, has, has different definitions, but Kanaloa is synonymous with security. And I'm gonna press this idea of security because we already have begun to do that with Tina and national security. Kanaloa is also firmness. Uh, Kanaloa is immovable. Kanaloa is unconquerable. Uh, Kanaloa is a depth of knowledge that is, is, is sanctuary. Kanaloa is, is confidence to establishment. <clears throat> and so when we look back at Kanaloa, I mean, we, we think we think about Kanaloa, he's always paired with Kane, right? The other main akua for um, Hawaiians. And as many mo'olala inform us, Kane and Kanaloa give us many of the, the necessary data to understanding what it is that sustains life. And what do we need? We need warmth. We need the sun. We need light. We need water. We need Kane. Um, and so Kane is both sun and vai. Kane is specifically that of penetrating water, so water that springs forth from the earth. Kane is um, the light of day, the eastern sky, sunrise, and Kanaloa is the antithesis, but they are very complementary. And Kanaloa could be thought of as the western sky, uh, sunset. Um, the one who understands depth, obscurity, um, and the one who draws upon positions of passive, passivity and firmness to, for active state, for activation. Kanaloa is this um, passivity to activation, um, the locator of, of knowledge of water storage. So those deep storages, those aquifers, they're also Kanaloa. And then in the sky and the sea, Kinolao Kanaloa proliferate oxygen to the process of oxygen, collaborating with other Akua to create oxygen uh, for carbon storage, um, deep sea currents and all these things, climate regulation. These are all uh, Kinolao Kanaloa. Um, so in other words, 
this pairing is almost crucial to the ways in which we live and the ways we continue and survive. And so if we have no confidence in our in, in the relationality between Kanaloa and Kane and us and Hawaii, then we are most most definitely easily easily conquerable, right? And this is why we have um, we have Kanaloa practices to help us understand these um, that section of um, survival. And um, I explained in one of my my personal videos um, that was shared through the Cancer Impact Coalition. And I, I uh, introduced myself as part of the Kei Kanaloa Network. But um, it, it's almost an indisputable fact that if you're a Kei Kanaloa, uh, you oppose RIMPAC. Because the, the decision to hold war games, to hold military exercises on land and sea, places these marine mammals in um, at a greater risk for, for serious and needless harm. And moreover, RIMPAC allows the US um, to assist in the training of other nations in the use of military maneuvers and war technologies, right, to be used on other seas and other people. And, and this is an ongoing, this is an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing assault on Kanaloa is that they're actually using Kanaloa to, to, to wage war on other people to get them more battle ready. And, the, and their justification has always been national security. You know, they're gonna keep on pressing national security, national security. You know, it's like them saying, um, we, you don't want us to do this or you're not gonna be safe, right? It's always been about troop readiness, national relations and coalitions have always um, argued and even filed lawsuits against the Navy to restrict the use of sonar specifically. And, and as Kei Kanaloa, we continually um, press this issue of the use of naval sonar. And, and because of the direct effects to Kanaloa, as in cetaceans, so Kanaloa is our cetacean ohana, our kupuna, our whales, our sperm whales, humpbacks. And while the Navy suggests that sonar use is highly unlikely to, to disrupt marine life or to cause death, other other researchers have cited sonar as as um, with the high potential to kill thousands of marine mammals, to cause permanent injury and temporary deafness. And and for our our Kanaloa, the the, the hearing and equilibrium are, are similar to ours to ours, right? Um, their equilibrium and their ability to dive is tied, right? And so when sonar uh, low frequency to, to mid frequency. Mid frequency can be devastating on a Kanaloa's ability to dive and regulate depth. So you'll see, and these, these are our kilo, these are observations by our own people, right? They lose the ability to dive, they get the bends or what they call um, decompression sickness, right? Uh, humans suffer this too. And, and we, have, uh, we have personally seen, and the Navy will never, you know, admit to this, but these are these are impacts of naval sonar and uh, the national the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. They should be out there citing the military because that is their job, right? And as Kei Kanaloa, we this is the realm that we work in to some point. And NOAA, instead of of protecting Kanaloa, they have this very arbitrary, this very capricious capricious show of authority that allows naval, the Navy incidental take permits, right? And sometimes they don't even require the Navy to do so. Um, and then the incidental take permits will allow, allow them to, to harm, to molest, to disrupt the, the livelihood of Kanaloa. And Navy research, nor researchers use a sort of repeated cross-sectional random collection, data collection methodology, right? And as, as as researchers ourselves, um, we would like to say that's a flawed methodology, right? That methodology only takes snapshots of whales. Instead, they, they should be taking a more of a longitudinal uh, method that looks at the same whales over long periods of time. And one of the issues with RIMPAC is that researchers are gonna, re researchers gonna be like this with their binoculars while RIMPAC is going on on the other side, right? 
the, the, the binos are never on where what's happening, right? And, and so who's in these situations, whose authority is gonna keep these countries, uh, the US in check during this time of impact, right? Who has been the authority, right? And then, and that's why US imperialism is so efficient. It's so ridiculous. It's so, they're so damn good at it, right? And, you know, imperialism at its height is when no one questions the lack of transparency, right? No one, no one questions the flawed methodologies that they use. And so how do we, how do we coup air this? Um, what is the act of air here, I guess? To, to me, it's, it's, to me, it's building communities of kilo, of, of observers, people who know what they're looking at, people who can, who can kilo the realm of Kanaloa. Um, because we know that there are discrepancies in what is reported. Um, our communities have been seeing, observing much different things than what, what the federal environmental observers have been observing. Um, you know, and, and, and lower courts, lower courts will recognize the dangers of naval sonar, especially, <clears throat> but, the, but the Supreme Court will continue to allow the use of mid-frequency sonar. <clears throat> and, and this is all for the sake of national security. And this in essence is just imperialism working as intended. It's a type of <clears throat> paternalistic manifest destiny type of BS, right? I'm the father, you the kid. I know what's good for you, you don't. Um, uh, whether it's security or science. But um, so Kei Kana Law has kind of been <coughs> working this angle and working in this realm. And, and, and the work of Kei Kana Law has reflects this type of air. And so Kei, for personally, a uh, personal story. Um, 2004, impacts going on. I get a call from my cousin. Um, usually, he's the he's the cousin that tells me, "Oh, we sur we just surrounded Akule in the bay in Hanalei Bay, where I'm from." <clears throat> but this time it was different. He said that there were um, a huge pot of whales that are look look like they are distressed in Hanalei Bay, right? Um, and by the time I get there, we have uncles and aunties who are already on shore. They're weaving kohue hue vine together, and you. Um, you know, as a communal fishing um, place, this this is like reminiscent of Puki Lao, right? We're gonna weave together Lao, and we're gonna corral fish, but in this case, whales, and all of the the uncles and aunties and cousins and family members and community members all work together to um, corral the melon head part of melon head whales um, out, and that, <clears throat> that was my first, I guess. One of my more distinct uh, events that connected that showed me the the conflict of U.S. military and and Kanawha. <clears throat> so Kiai Kanawha, the network though, has started you know over four years ago during a time when our two of our leaders were in litigation. Uh, 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 who we called uh, Kai Palawa uh, and Keloha Pishoda and Roxy. Uh, Kili Kipi or Kaniko Kolohaka, and she, their fight made it very obvious. They were pers persecuted by Noah for a sea burial of a whale in um, Kauai Hai. And it, what it made obvious was that Native Hawaiians are highly vulnerable to prosecution for participating, for um, conducting religious and cultural practices under the MMPA or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And, and we, we found that problematic. And so the types of roles that we we hold now are have to do with the direct care of Kanaloa and also for advocating the protection of Kanaloa. And, and, just, and just allowing ourselves to be uh, those space holders when our Kanaloa decide to pie or they decide to arrive at our shores. Uh, we are not only uh, trained culturally, uh, train religious practitioners, but we also have to train for stranding events. We have to understand Kanawha anatomy. <clears throat> we have to understand the politicization of Kanawha and Ivi Kanawha or um, whale bones and uh, Niho. And this is all done in understanding the MMPA, uh, UNDRIP, 
um, NAGPRA, and, but we are also additionally communities that have been working to get agents to, agencies to be more transparent uh, and to build relationships with communities, uh, communities of practice. Um, we continue to also advocate for laws that protect Kanoa practitioners and Kia'i. Um, and one of our, our, our main goals right now is to just to create more communities of, of Kia'i and Kilo, um, and Kilo for Kanaloa. Uh, we want to abolish the use of euthanasia. And this is one of our very, oh, one that tugs at the heart, is the use of euthanasia on whales and dolphins for the sake of public safety and science. And, and we will always advocate for allowing the Kanaloa to determine their own outcomes. Never, we will never use euthanasia on our kupuna. Well, why would we use it on our Kanaloa kupuna? Um, at the moment, relationships are improving as a Kia'i Kanaloa network continues to work with these settler agencies, knowing that this isn't, this isn't the end game. Yeah. All right, the end game is to, to have uh, communities of Kia'i and Kilo all over. Um, to me, security looks more like Kanaloa. It, it, it is a, a very important topic right now, as we are in a while pandemic. Um, and there has been a rise in support for abolition policies regarding police and security within our own communities. Um, and and I, I, I challenge you to understand what kind of law security looks like. Yeah, so <laughs> my, my pre-final thought are actually questions. And I would say that um, these are questions that we should be asking ourselves and asking each other is like, <clears throat> what is the cost of impact? And, and, and the other panelists, I'm sure, will, will have, will touch on these things. And another question is, is the protection of Kanaloa and national security mutually, mutually exclusive? Um, and I think uh, an even better, an even better question would be, as an as a independent nation state, can Hawaii foster a Kanaloa framework for building national security and oceanic relations? I think we can, we've done it before. Um, again, like as, as Tina said, and as many of us know, uh, we have won that, that battle before. Um, and we continue to win battles uh, with the help of Kanaloa. So I, I, I believe many of you have been following uh, Hunana Niho, uh, Juan Manalo, and heard about the dozen or so Honu that are nesting in Juan Manalo. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to recognize that that is an Akua process, right? That is a process that is, um, that happens, a phenomenon that happens without the intervention of humans, without the, without Kanaka intervening, right? And so in the, in the Kumulipo, it says, you know, Oke Akua Ke Komo, Aole Komo Kanaka. This is the place that, that, that Akua can enter and man cannot. Um, but it is, our, it is our job to recognize them, but not to intervene. Um, that Honu nesting, um, you know, what they call bellows, is just a showing up of, of Kanaloa saying, this is, this is really what's up right now. You know, this is what, um, this is his job. This is his job to create balance, create equilibrium. And then and, and we should just be, we should just mahalo that uh, Kanalo is giving us a lesson on Kanal by or on, on um, yeah. Yeah, mahalo. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Mahalo, Billy. That's a perfect um, way to wrap up your presentation. Um, I love this idea of Kanalo security. So let's meditate on that throughout the rest of our session here. You know, what does Kanalo security look like? Unconquerable firm um so uh and how can we manifest that in the hawaiian uh, with AI? right so all right so now uh, we're gonna pivot to uh emilani case who is uh from uh, originally from waimea area and so she'll be taking us from um 
Pohakuloa and the slopes of Mauna Kea all the way to across Mauna Nui to Aotearoa and uh, the impacts of RIMPAC in a place like Pohakuloa all the way to the solidarity that's happening on the other side of the ocean. So mahalo emalani. Aloha mai kako. Um, oh, just a huge mahalo to, um, to everybody who's, who's sharing tonight, uh, to Kyle for moderating, to everyone at um, La Hoi Hoi uh, Honolulu for, for holding this and providing this space to have these critical conversations um, and to also feel, you know, I've been feeling so much as I've been sitting here listening, watching the poem, listening to Tina, listening to Billy. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, as we talk about these really heavy things, we have to provide time as well to feel them. Um, that's part of what fuels and motivates our activism. So I'm sitting here feeling a lot um, and, and really honored to share. Um, as Kyle said, I'm originally from Waimea on the Big Island. Um, I live in Aotearoa now. So today I'm going to be kind of talking about Mauna and Moana solidarity, you know, kind of mountain to, to sea activism um, and co connections across um, Oceania. And I thought I would start, you know, just taking us to the Mauna because I know so many of us are holding the Mauna right now in our heart. We do all the time, but, you know, just thinking about where we all were one year ago. Um, so many of us up at Pu'uhonua o Pu'uhuluhulu standing together for the protection of our mountain. Um, and I remember flying home from Aotearoa and standing there. And so if you, if you were there for one afternoon or for months on end, I'm sure you went to one of the protocol ceremonies and I thought I would start with um, just bringing into this space one of the chants that is done every single day on the Mauna and that is the Vanana or the prophecy that was first uttered by Kapihe either back in 1811 or 1812 depending on the record you're looking at. But that Vanana says, that prophecy says, right? What is up is going to come down, what is below is going to rise, the islands are going to unite, the walls will stand. And what I love about that vanana is, you know, as Tina mentioned earlier, sometimes when you talk about things like RIMPAC or when you engage in activism um, against something like RIMPAC or when you, when you engage in conversation that is about decolonialism or demilitarization, it is heavy. And sometimes you're like, this is overwhelming. But we have these gifts from our kupuna, right? We have things like that prophecy that for me, I carry it every day because it reminds me to maintain that radical sense of hope that change is always possible, that we've done it before, that we will do it again, that what is up will come down, that we will not only rise, but we are already rising. Right, we are already seeing unification. We are already coming together. So that maintaining that radical hope that is embedded in that vanana is not only a gift we have, but a responsibility. So I just thought I'd start there, you know, bringing us all to the Mauna, taking us all to Mauna Kea, you know, really highlighting that that those words that we have that we continue that we can continue to use today, even when it gets heavy, when it gets too kaumaha, um, we have that. Um, and I also wanted to take us to the Mauna because I think, if anything, you know, what Mauna Kea teaches me is that when we say kukia i Mauna, we are standing to be protectors of the mountain from the pico, from the summit, all the way to Pohakuloa, all the way down to the ocean, all the way to, down to the part of the mountain that we can't see because it's at the ocean floor. So when we kukia i Mauna, we are, we are we're standing as protectors for that entire mountain, which means we are standing to protect everything that that, rep, that, that Mauna represents. You know, And I know we all know this, but I think it's just, um, I think it's important to make those connections, you know, that calling for the cancellation and the end of RIMPAC, calling for demilitarization is to also say, we need to protect our mountain um, because they are one in the same. And I think when we look at our activism that way, when we look at our protective responsibilities in that way, we also, we also embrace a more encompassing view of Aina you know, Aina is not just the physical ground that we stand upon. Aina is every single thing that feeds us, mountain, ocean, lani in the sky as well. It's everything that nourishes us physically, spiritually, culturally, mentally, emotionally. Um, so when we kukia'i mauna, we kukia'i for all of that. So um, 
speaking really specifically on how RIMPAC impacts Mauna Kea, um, I'd like to just take you not too far away from the Pu'uhonua or Pu'uhuluhulu to Pohakuloa. Um, and so Pohakuloa is um, located in the saddle, what we call the saddle between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. Um, and Pohakuloa is um, the largest land-based training area in Hawaii. Um, it is larger than the island of Kaho'olawe. It's massive. Um, and so Poha Pohakuloa, the training area, the Pohakuloa training area is made up of over 100,000 acres, um, about 80,000 or so acres were taken for training during World War II. Another 23,000 acres are ceded lands. And then they also have acreage that they purchased from Parker Ranch, um, which is you know, the biggest cattle ranch on the Big Island. Um, and before I really dig into to some of the impacts at Pohakulo, I do want to say that I actually like I, I still consider myself to be like a baby in this movement. And there are so many voices and there's so many people who have been making these connections for so long, who've been standing for Pohakulo for so long. Just a few names to bring into this space that are really important. Auntie Max, Auntie Maxine Kahaulelio, Uncle Ku Ching, Kealoha Pishoda, Jim Albertini, and Malu Aina. You know, they've been standing for so long, and they're the reason why people like me can stand now, you know. Um, even some of the younger Kia'i, you know, in the Cancel Rimpack poem, we were so honored to have Ruth close it, you know, Ruth Aloha close it, sitting in the forest with the birds that came in at the perfect time. But she's also been another really strong voice, a really strong kia'i who has made sure that we never forget that Pohakuloa is part of the Mauna and that we have to call for its protection. So I just wanted to bring some of those names in. Um, but, you know, Pohakuloa, we might say this year that because RIMPAC is going to be at sea only, we might say Pohakuloa is spared from being hit by RIMPAC, but really Pohakuloa is hit every single day by militarization. Pohakuloa is damaged and desecrated every single day. So RIMPAC just amplifies that. RIMPAC just, you know, adds to it when, that, when those training exercises come um, to, to the big island. Um, but, you know, again, RIMPAC or no RIMPAC, Pohakuloa is still being damaged. Um, and so basically, like the military uses that space for all kinds of training, everything from sniper practice to throwing grenades to, um, you know, different kind of exercises, torpedoes, they have munitions, they have, you know, what they call dummy bombs. Um, and I actually read some months back, somebody at the Pohakuloa training area actually said, oh no, we don't bomb land at Pohakuloa. We do um, what they call precision munitions. And apparently that means that they're not, that because they're trying to be so precise that the impact is going to be less. Um, and I was like, call it whatever you want. You're still hurting Aina. And I don't really care what you call it because I felt it, you know, like I grew up feeling those bombs. So you call it a, a precision munition or call it a bomb, whatever you want. It still hurts the same way. You know, I remember years ago, a, a, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, my nephew at the time was only about two months old. And I remember sitting at my parents' house in Waimea and I was holding him babysitting and I could feel it, the bombing was horrible that day. And I remember sitting down, writing a letter to the US Army garrison at Pohakuloa because they had put out a statement saying, if you have any complaints, write a letter. So I wrote a letter and I was like, it really is heartbreaking to me that my two month old nephew has felt more bombs in his life than, he's, than days he's been alive. Explain that to me, you know, explain that to me explain why my other nephew has to go to school and learn about unexploded ordinance and how to handle it. You tell me why that's normal. Um, they wrote back saying they didn't know what to do with my letter <laughs> and they didn't know how to respond. Um, and that's because they only know how to respond in technical language and they didn't know how to speak to my heart. And that's the issue, right? That militarism doesn't see us as being human beings. 
They see our land and they see our people as things that are expendable for the so-called greater good, for so-called security, not for us, but for somebody else. Uh, but anyway, to get back to Pohakuloa, you know, um, the military just has proven time and time again that they can't take care of that place, that they haven't taken care of that place. And I have to give, you know, so much of my aloha and mahalo to Auntie Max and Uncle Ku, who filed a lawsuit in 2014, um, you know, basically saying that DLNR, who is supposed to be holding the military accountable to those ceded lands that they lease, um, you know, they filed a lawsuit suit saying that they were not doing that. They weren't holding the military and the army accountable. And so they won that case in 2018. And then, of course, Ige being Ige appealed it. Um, but the Hawaii C Supreme Court reaffirmed that case last year, you know, basically saying that the state has to develop a plan to maintain that environment. Of course, when you really think about it, it's just, it just seems like a complete contradiction in terms to, to order an entity that destructs and desecrates every single day to maintain the environment. To even think that that's possible is ridiculous to me. But still, that was a huge win because it's once again showing how the state cannot be trusted and once again showing that we need to hold them accountable. So hopefully with that lawsuit and with that win, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to um, you know the, the lease is up in 2029 and so this is something that we can use in order to say no that lease should never be um, they should never get a renewed lease um, but yeah and and you know just to also talk about Pohakuloa a little bit more you know one of the most damaging things that I see happening at Pohakuloa is not only the actual environmental damage, but the way that Pohakuloa is framed. Pohakuloa, if you go there, it looks empty, right? From a certain perspective, it might look empty, it might look barren. If you read reports of soldiers who have trained there, they talk about its rough conditions or its rough terrain. They say, oh, it's dry. You know, it's optimal for us to go there because there's no buildings and, you know, we can just train and do our thing. And that's been so damaging, not only for the place itself, but even for some residents on the Big Island who've come to adopt this idea that Pohakuloa is barren wasteland and therefore able to be sacrificed. So what so many of, of the Kia'i have been doing that I really appreciate and, and I just, you know, that, and I think is so important is they've been saying, you know, it's not that we need physical structures and we need people living there to prove that that place is significant. In fact, it is so significant, that's why no one's living there. It's like the Pico. We're not going to build a 30 meter telescope on the top of our mountain because it is kapu, it is sacred. And just because there's no buildings up there doesn't mean that it isn't. We're not occupying it for a reason. You know, it's that colonial mentality that you have to mark spaces with physical structures to deem them significant that is now being imposed on our Mauna from the summit down to Pohakuloa and all the way down to the shoreline, really. Um, so, you know, in, in, in calling for demilitarization, we also have to kind of work towards dismantling these colonial structures and these colonial ideologies, I should say, that have made us even think about our land in particular ways. Um, but to also bring it into Oceania, so down from Pohakuloa into, into the Pacific, um, as Kyle mentioned earlier, I live in Aotearoa and I've been really, really lucky um, to be able to work with people here in this country who understand that, in, that, that RIMPAC is not just impacting Hawaii, that it has implications for all of us. Um, so I've been working with some peace groups here and some activists, some indigenous activists, some scholars, some artists, some poets. There are some um, poets from Aotearoa in the Cancel Impact poem. Um, and we've been lobbying the government here. We've been trying to get New Zealand and the New Zealand Defense Force to pull out of RIMPAC. Unfortunately, they haven't and they are going to send a small contingent. But I think what's really beautiful is that we can see these networks of solidarity strengthening and growing. Um, and you know, what's interesting is that RIMPAC has as its slogan, I think it's capable adaptive partners and, and the US Navy often kind of tries to promote RIMPAC as this exercise in building regional partnerships and regional capabilities. But when I think about Oceania, I think 
you know, our regionalism and our solidarity is so much older than RIMPAC. It goes back generations. So we have the opportunity now to really build on the efforts of our kupuna who never saw themselves as being separate and to also build on early, you know, more recent efforts like the nuclear free and independent um, Pacific movement and to look at that and find inspiration in that to keep building and strengthening our solidarities. Epeli Ho'ofa, the amazing um, Oceanian scholar talked about regionalism and he said in the past we've seen people come together when they faced a threat to their common inheritance and what is that common inheritance to link back to Billy? It is the Moana, it is the ocean, it is Kanaloa. And so again we have that opportunity now to continue to strengthen these networks and these solidarities and to also really be honest about the ways that we connect and have been disconnected as pacific peoples as tina mentioned earlier you know hawaii is is the place where rimpac is held and we have pacific participation in rimpac so what does that mean Tonga is a participating nation. New Zealand is a participating nation. Indonesia is, an, is a participating nation, right? So what impacts does that participation have on the indigenous people where these, these defense forces are coming from? Here in Aotearoa, we have seen the American style militarization of the police. You know, the, so it has these impacts and we have to be honest about the implications that, are, that run across the ocean so that we can build our solidarities from there. Um, so with all of that said, I thought I would um, take us back to the mountain, <laughs> just going from the Mauna to the Kai across the Moana. Um, but I thought I would end again with that vanana, with that prophecy. Um, and what another thing I love about Kapihe's words is that over time, you know, if you look at the Nupepa Olalo Hawaii, if you look at the Hawaiian language newspapers, people have found across the generations inspiration and hope in that banana. Um, and in 1862, in the newspaper Kahokuo Kapa Kipika, um, a writer named Kawa Koiave took that banana and wrote down another version of it. So it's quite similar, but the last line reads, E hui ana ho'ina pai moku mai kahikia Hawaii nei iho kahi. So he said, the Apai Moku, these archipelagos, these groups of islands from Kahiki, from our ancestral homeland in the Pacific, all the way to Hawaii, are going to become one. And I love that, Manana, and I keep building on it today because I think it prophesizes and speaks to an oceanic solidarity that we had, that we still remember in our saltwater tears and in our saltwater sweat. We know we have that ocean in us and we can continue to build on it for a free and independent and demilitarized anti-rimpat Oceania. <laughs> so, mahalo nui, yakakuapo. Mahalo, Emelani, that's beautiful. Um, I was writing down some of your stuff here so we can remember it. Uh, so that's a perfect uh, segue for our Final speaker, uh, Kisha. Um, she's going to talk about the experience in Guahan. They've been fighting a lot of things too, and they also have a cautionary tale with regard to the military as a COVID carrier, right? The the vector of disease, the vector of invasion, and the threats that it brings. So, um, Kisha, welcome. Um, wow, what a! I just need to commend all of my fierce friends here or fierce family. Um, Wow, uh, Amalani, this is Masi, that was, yeah, this is great. Um, so, half a day to the Hamzu, Guavas to Kisha Bora Kitsu Kaho, Gin and Islan Guahanzu, Giza Islas Marianas, San Dunklunasi to a San Sina Maasi, Parato to Hamzu, ST, uh, Parastina webinar, um, who Agredesi Tolu, eat at Sutmitu. Um, Aloha Kako to all of you folks who are joining us today. I'm speaking from Guahan, which is more commonly known as Guam in the Mariana Islands. I'm a member of Ihagan Fomalau and Guahan, a Samoru women's organization and Women's Voices Women Speak. Um, mahalo nui, sana maasi again to the Laho Iho Iea organizing committee in Honolulu, especially Noelani and Imai, um, as well as Cameron for working on our tech stuff here. Um, thank you also to, again, to my other fierce friends um, who are joining in this discussion, Tina, Billy, and Melani. 
Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak about what is happening here in Guahan and to connect with our siblings in Hawaii and the greater Oceania. Um, so as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, um, I kept coming back to this story that we have here in Guahan. It's a story about how the shape of our island was formed. So there's this giant fish that was eating at the middle of our island and it threatened to split Guahan into two. Some Moru fishermen uh, tried to capture this fish but were, and tried to protect our island, but were unsuccessful. And so when our Tsumoto women heard about this, they were hanging out at one of our rivers and they devised a plan to protect our island. So they wove their long hair into a net and used the kana of their hair and of their voices to lure the giant fish into the net. And eventually they captured this fish and protected our home. And so while this story is important to us because it tells us how the shape of our island was formed, it's perhaps even more invaluable because it teaches us the importance of community and of protecting our home together. So before talking about the COVID-19 crisis on Guahan, I'd first like to share some background information about the US militarization of Guahan for folks who might not be familiar. Um, Guahan is about 30 miles long, eight miles wide, almost the size of Molokai. Um, and one third of our island is currently occupied for the military's Air Force base, naval base, munitions, storage facilities, and housing. And um, many of our families are still waiting to be reconnected with our lands and waters, especially in the southern village of Sumai and the northern villages of Hinaksan and Lipeksan. Um, so I'm, regarding the COVID-19 crises, much has happened in our community. And it's my hope that you folks can learn from our experiences. And, um, you know, going back to what Emilani was talking about in terms of solidarity, right? This is, you know, um, this is one way that we can help each other is by learning from our experiences, learning from, um, you know, what's happening in our communities and, and hopefully stopping them before, before they enter other communities. Um, and so for us, you know, I'm hoping that people in Hawaii can learn from us. Um, because it's, it's, it's really scary what's been happening, especially during this pandemic. Um, so our first confirmed COVID-19 cases showed up back in mid-March. And by the end of March, as most of you have probably heard through the news, um, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, an aircraft carrier, which had over 4,000 personnel on board, docked in Guahan after 23 COVID-19 cases were confirmed on the ship. And at that time, our community had mixed feelings about what to do with the sailors on the ship. So our local government welcomed the sailors and worked out a business transaction with the military, um, where about 2,000 sailors from the USS Roosevelt, who initially tested negative, um, could be housed off base in our local hotels. Um, however, local organizations like Ihag and Famala and Guahan were quite concerned about this, and we implored our governor to rethink her dangerous decision. Our main concerns about this um, uh, included the jeopardization, of course, of our community's health um, and safety, the possibility of false negatives, um, because a lot of these sailors were initially tested prior to docking on Guahan. So anything could have been happened in terms of their exposure to those who tested positive at first, right? Um, and then we were also concerned about the lack of accountability and transparency on the part of the military. Um, but on both the, our governor side or our government side, as well as the military side, they kept saying, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Um, we're going to do our best to make sure that um, the local community's health and safety are prioritized and, and that everyone is taken care of. Um, but of course, by April, local citizens' concerns about this sailor situation came to fruition. So what ended up happening is that more than 1,150 sailors eventually tested positive for COVID-19, including sailors who were housed in our local hotels. Um, and then there was at least one sailor who broke the quarantine protocol by leaving his hotel room. And so even though by June, the Roosevelt left the island without major damage to our community, there still remained the possibility of harm for our island. And that's not a risk that anyone anywhere should be willing to, to take. Um, so in addition now to the USS Theodore Roosevelt situation, in the past three months, um, the, US, the U.S. military has beefed up its presence on Guahan um, in addition right, to its already one-third occupation of our island. So it's increased its trainings 
um, throughout the island. So these trainings used to happen maybe once every month, once every two months. And at one point they were happening once every week. I mean, excuse me, not once every week, but um, every week, every day for a week. Um, and this was really problematic because they were happening both on base and in residential areas throughout our island. And then in April, the Air Force removed its five B-52 bombers from our Air Force base, but then shortly thereafter deployed four B-1 bombers from Texas back here. And then a few weeks ago, about 350 Alaska-based paratroopers were flown in and made their jumps uh, to the Air Force base. And then there's just been a continuation of what's now been called the military buildup, which is the um, preparation for the transfer of the 5,000 Marines from Okinawa to Guahan. So that those project buildup related projects have continued even during this pandemic and despite our community opposition. Um, and then finally, Guahan has been identified as a safe haven liberty port where naval ships can dock for sailors rest and relaxation. And so um, the US military has identified certain safe haven liberty ports throughout the world where US naval ships can dock. And so Guahan following I, the supposed success of the US Theodore Roosevelt situation became one of these um, safe haven spots. Um, and with that, that that's problematic because um, the military has assured our community that the sailors um, who dock as part of the safe haven um, uh, ports, when they dock, when the ships dock, these sailors don't have to, uh, wouldn't actually be leaving the base. However, they will be um, disembarking from the ship and will come into contact with. Um, other military personnel and local residents who work on base and then you know all of those people will leave off base and so it's again still a danger for our community. Um, and then perhaps some of the latest concerns in our island is that the military is exempt um, similar to Hawaii from our local quarantine protocol um, and we are always kept in the dark of the number of military personnel and their dependents coming in and, out of, in and out of Guahan and the number of military personnel and dependents who test positive for COVID-19. And so the exemption from the local quarantine protocol it, um, puts our community at risk because even just recently there was a spike in our positive cases when 35 airmen um, who were exempt from this protocol, our local protocol, were staying at a local hotel and they tested positive um, and then and also broke the um, their their quarantine protocol by going to 30 local um, establishments. So so even though they're exempt from our protocol, they have a particular protocol and, and one of those things includes that they are supposed they are allowed to stay off base at a local hotel, but they have to go straight to work and then go back to the hotel. But again, questions of accountability and transparency come up because they can go anywhere they want on their way to work and on their way back to the hotel. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And so this put our community at risk and it also hurt our local businesses because for a few weeks following that um, situation, um, a lot of our people in our local community refused to um, go to those local businesses. Um, and so there's just all of these things happening and despite all of it, we are, you know, continuing as a community to do what we can to prioritize our health and safety. Um, our local groups and organizations continue to make and distribute masks for our people, distribute food and promote food security and we're working to take care of ourselves even while the military continuously harms our people and our environment. So connecting all of this to RIMPAC, we have to consider what happened with the USS Roosevelt, the outbreak of COVID-19, and the need for sailors to be housed off the ship. We also need to consider how the airmen housed in a local hotel off base contributed to the recent spike in positive cases in Guahan. And these should be quite concerning for Hawaii because although the military is currently proposing only at-sea trainings for its RIMPAC exercises, it's possible that an outbreak could occur on the sea vessels which come from many countries right now as opposed to just one, as opposed to just the US, um, and that the Hawaii government and local community would be devastatingly impacted. It's also problematic that the military continues to be exempt from local quarantine protocols and that it withholds information from the civilian community um, because who knows what the military is hiding and how it might devastate our island communities and how will the military be held accountable for its decisions, especially when they potentially jeopardize the health and safety of those who live outside the fence. Um, and here in Guahan, we've long understood what war does to community. 
um, how war deeply affects our home and our peoples. We know this difficult journey very well. And this is why it's even more important for all of us in Guahan, in the Marianas, in Hawaii, in Aotearoa, and all of Oceania to continue connecting and weaving our net of solidarity across our ocean, as um, Emilani was talking about earlier. Um, so going back to the story about how Guahan Shape was formed, everyone had to work together. Not a single person or a single group could protect our island alone. And so I think in our case, Across Oceania, our solidarity is only as strong as our commitment to each other. So it's time that we go forward and we stand up together and we rise with our net and protect our home islands, our peoples, and our ocean from the giant fish. Um, it's time that we work together to stop RIMPAC, to stop the military buildup, to stop all military occupation, the bombings and the desecration of our lands and our waters, um, because this is our responsibility that we have to each other. Um, wow. Thank you, Keisha. Um, thank you all of, all of our panelists. Um, that was amazing. Um, and we're almost up on time, but I'm wondering if we can negotiate for a little bit more time. Would you all be okay to stay maybe for another 15 minutes or so, so we could have some conversation? Is that okay with the organizers? Noilani, Cameron? With us. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, um, yeah, so does anyone have any uh, questions for our panelists? Um, I wonder, well, I had, I, I had a question about, uh, um, or comment, I guess, just, your story, Keisha, about uh, what's happening in Guahan, uh, how the military is not accountable, uh, and how the fact that the local community has no control over uh, their movements uh, is puts us all at risk. And there was recently an incident in uh, Okinawa with uh, an outbreak on the base, or two bases in Okinawa, and it's, it's spreading. And it's really, um, uh, you know, their government has, has put more pressure, I think, than ours has uh, for answers, for, for data. We can't even get those statistics. Um, so let's see, there's a question that just came in. Uh, what, can, what else can community members do? Will there be other events, uh, letters, things to um, put pressure on state officials? Can does anyone want to take that one? How about Tina, can you? Sure. Um, we, so there's a petition up and it has like 11,000 signatures. We can probably pop the link into the chat. Um, and I think writing letters to our representatives is really important. Writing um, op-eds and educating the public about the risks of RIMPAC this year but also beyond is, is really important too. Um, one frustrating thing was that in the beginning of the pandemic, we actually saw some of our public officials take action in ways that we wouldn't normally expect. So there was a resolution that moved through the Honolulu City Council um, calling for Ige to request that the US Pacific Fleet cancel RIMPAC. Um, but after the Pacific Fleet announced those um, alterations to RIMPAC, that um, resolution was killed. And when I called the office of Ron Menor, the, the person who introduced it, um, his staff member said that um, it was considered the issue was considered resolved and that someone from the military asked them to take it off of the agenda um, so i think all of these things are really important um, to be in constant communication with our public officials and hold them accountable but then we also see that you know this is life under occupation that even ige the most he can do is request that the Pacific Fleet cancel it. He can't, he has no say over it. Um, so the other thing I think is thinking about 
um, direct actions, how we can mobilize. If RIMPAC 2020 does happen, how can we intervene or at least make a public showing of our opposition? Because we have to remember that even if we don't get it canceled in 2020, this is part of a much bigger fight. So each year we can build momentum. Um, if we can come up with an action and mobilize our communities this year, then that puts us in a better position for two years from now. Thank you. And, and um, folks can connect with us through the Cancel Impact Coalition um, page on Facebook um, for future events. Um, let's see, I wanted to, um, are there any other questions? I wanted to just talk about um, uh, Arundhati Roy wrote a beautiful essay about um, the pandemic being a portal, um, like a kipuka, an opening into a different kind of reality. And so it forces us, a crisis like this is, is an opportunity to bring about a change, fundamental changes. And we're seeing that with the Black Lives Matter, we're seeing it with um, um, the indigenous um, resurgence happening all over. Uh, so I'm just wondering, um, and, and also with Mauna Kea, right? And Hunana Niho, Kahuku, uh, all of these places. So. Um, what uh, what do you think are the how how can the defund police defund military abolish RIMPAC uh, grow um, in your own work? And anyone can jump in. All right, I'll I'll um I'll jump on that one. <laughs> I think for me, um, something that I I've not only been incur like challenging myself to do, but something I've also been challenging my students to do, is to stop seeing all of these movements as being separate. They're actually all connected. You know, if I say defund the police, I'm also calling for defunding the military. And if I say Black Lives Matter, I am also advocating for, a, for climate justice, you know? And if I say, um, you know, cancel RIMPAC now and forever, I am calling for decolonization. I am calling for indigenous rights. I'm calling for a better world for people of color, for marginalized communities, for disadvantaged communities. Our movements are actually so much are very, very connected. And it's only, I think, colonial mentalities that have separated them to make us feel like we're smaller in number. Um, and I don't make those connections to take anything away from movements. Instead, I try to make those connections to strengthen them. And you know, if we think about the pandemic as this portal, you know, one of the, the, the things that was said when COVID-19 you know, started to earlier this year when it really started to to grow and start impacting many areas was we're all in this together you know and of course we knew that covid was going to impact different communities disproportionately so i was like actually we're not all in this together because it's impacting some of us more than others but if you're going to say that then get down on the dirt with us and do the work with us and learn why it's impacting some communities more than others you know and realize that covid is a colonial issue is a race issue, is a class issue, is linked to militarism. We can see that right now with, with RIMPAC. The fact that they're willing to have war games in our homeland during a pandemic, why, why is that happening? That links to the roots of structural racism in the Pacific, in Hawaii. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, uh, Kyle, but I do think that like, Thinking about COVID and how it's, it's, it's forced us all to kind of think of our worlds differently, that's just been something that's been really obvious to me is see the connection, find the connection, make the connection obvious and visible for people um, so that we can continue to, to grow solidarities and, and networks and fight for the world that we actually want to live with, live in you know, and redefine safety and redefine security. I loved that idea of Kanaloa security, by the way, just the way it was phrased. I was like, of course, that's, that's it. That's the world I want to live in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Yo, thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? I, I want to maybe comment and jump off of both of these, these questions, really great questions. Um, 
And I love this idea of um, all of these issues being one, and maybe not one, but also maybe like a field of spirals and they all spiral out and they all connect to each other, right? And this idea of spirality. And, and that's how I like to see them. And as much as Kanaloa Kaho'olawe is a portal, a pandemic is a portal, George Floyd's a portal, you know, and these are all um, portals that spiral, like, spiral out and touch each other. And I think um, one of the ways that proliferates in, in my mind and my mind's eyes that um, communities need to spiral and begin to um, build, build, build these connections to each other um, across issues, across um, disproportionate types of um, afflictions. Um, and I think um, if, if I could go back to the first question, I would say like one thing I would love to do is jump on a va'a and be out there, you know, and it, they've done it in Aotearoa before. Our, our Tita Tina, Tafana, and Rai, they jumped on a va'a and they got out there and they blocked size, they chased down seismic ships, which is amazing. And I, I would love, if anybody has a va'a, I mean, we have a va'a, but we're in we're on Kauai, but um, if we get a chance, we should do that. <laughs> Maybe that's kind of low security, I don't know. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Billy. Anybody, any other uh, comments? We have a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to just mention that one of, one of the things that came out of this pandemic is all these proposals, right, from the, uh, the Hawaii Commission on the Status of Women, a feminist uh, COVID recovery plan, uh, from the Aina Aloha of, of uh, Economic Futures, uh, a whole plan that's in integrating different uh, manao from, from various sectors. Uh, and in there is also a critique of the tourism as well as the military economies. Uh, and so it's given us a chance to really uh, evaluate what's important to us. What do we need to live uh, a full and meaningful and, and um, have genuine security, right? Uh, as opposed to this kind of militarized security that only seems to bring um, war and suffering and dispossession and destruction. And so um, I wonder if you have any, if, if uh, there are other things that you um, think of that are emerging from this, from the ruins of, of the pandemic and the ruins of capitalism and imperialism that's falling around us. Uh, do you see other signs of things sprouting up, you know, new emergencies that are happening? Um, can I just go ahead and answer yeah. this one? Um, and here in Guahan, um, I think we've seen in our community a lot more people um, starting to grow our own food. Um, similar to Hawaii, you know, we have more imports, um, more imported goods. And so um, that's been kind of a really exciting thing in the midst of this whole pandemic is that we've been able to grow our own food, even in Ihag and Famalao and Guahan, we've been able to distribute um, 200 sets of like seed packets to 200 families here. Um, and that was, you know, just the opportunity to be able to do that. But, there, but we also saw that there was a need for it. Like there were more than 200 families who were lining up for this kind of um, resource. And um, while it was unfortunate that we had to turn them away, what was exciting is that they're, you know, that we're actually saying, hey, we need to start feeding ourselves because we're not sure what's going to happen in terms of all the imported goods that are coming in, right? Like, will our, will our grocery stores always be stocked with the, with the foods that we need? Um, and, and in addition to that, we're also questioning or, or, or becoming more critical of how those foods are not healthy for us and how we need to really um, eat the food that we grow here. Um, and then I guess beyond that, that's beautiful, is that we then learn as we grow, as more of our people grow our own food um, or fish in our waters, then we become, we reconnect, right, back to our, our tanu and our tasi, and we become, um, you know, less disconnected from them like we were before as, as a, when we just go to like a grocery store. Um, so that's been something that I think has been really beautiful because then it also makes us kind of secure in growing our own food and then also see other kinds of sovereignty um, in addition to our political sovereignty. And once we can continue to do these kinds of things on our own, um, then we can know that we can actually 
you know, separate from the United States and become our own nation or, be, you know, whatever we want to be. Um, I think that's, that's one of the things here that's key for our community is that in other ways, if we can't see that we can do it by ourselves, then we won't know that we can politically be by ourselves um, or, or connect to our other sisters and brothers in Oceania. Um, so that's been kind of neat to see in our community. Thank you, Keisha, that's awesome. Um, there's some comments on the chat that I just want to share, um, kind of goes, builds on Billy's um, uh, inspiration to, to paddle out there. Uh, the, some of the Veterans for Peace are, are um, on our um, session today, uh, and they, they're in town uh, working with the Golden Rule, which is a, one of the original peace boats. It was a sailboat that sailed into the, or attempted to sail into the Marshall Islands test range to protest uh, nuclear testing. Uh, it's been re renovated by the Veterans for Peace and it's now here in Hawaii and we'll be doing some sales commemorating the um, uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki um, bombings, but also um, they're, they're here to support uh, cancer impact activities. So we can talk with them and, and coordinate some of our actions that would be uh, really awesome. Um, so mahalo to uh, Veterans for Peace, Helen, and Jerry and uh, Pete. So um, I think with that, we're kind of um, at the end of our time. I wanna just thank uh, the organizers of Laho Iho Iea for giving us this, this opportunity to um, share this manao with you, with uh, the audience. And um, mahalo to Tina, Emilani, Billy, and Keisha for um, sharing your manao with us and helping us weave together this net of solidarity of oceanic solidarity and Kanaloa security. I think that is the future that we need to um, um, malama in, in, into existence. It's already here, we need to make it stronger. So um, with that, um, thank you everyone for coming and, and listening. Uh, we'll see you next time, aloha.